Hi, welcome everybody to our next module. Um, we're going to call this module number three in the Master Pal series. And we decided for this module that we're going to combine two different of the separate modules, um, Presume Potential, which is technically number nine, and then uh, Time, which is number six. And again, this Master Pal series was created by the wonderful Tabitha Jones Weebler um, back in 2018. And hi, I am Gina Antrim. I am a Basque AEC facilitator and SLP by trade. And hi, I'm Maggie Judson, also an SLP and AAC therapist with Basque. Hello, hello. Yes, welcome. Uh, today, again, we're just going to continue with this Master Pal series and how to model as a Master Pal and how we can continue to develop um, becoming supporting exemplar AC communication partners. All right, so a couple um, refreshers, things to keep in mind. We're going to be talking a lot about AAC today and throughout the training series, but we're really getting into the communication partner skills and strategies that can apply when working with any student with language or communication needs. So this can apply to all of our students. And the model as a master pal series, um, we're going to be reviewing topics of how to motivate, accept multiple modalities, statements more than questions, time, which is today, wait time and time for growth, how to engage naturally with our AAC users, response is not required for them, presuming potential, which is again one of our topics today, appropriate prompting, and then we will be discussing let the child lead eventually. All right, so master pal, what does that mean? Let's go through the definitions. Master, so this is where we're becoming a skilled uh, practitioner. We're becoming skilled in an activity. We are getting knowledge and skill in it. So some synonyms, um, expert, becoming proficient in, no inside out. So this is where we are really getting into those uh, communication partner skills and learning the how, the why, the what, so that we become proficient in understanding why those skills are important and being able to provide, you know, become those good communication partner, um, communication partners for our students. But we also need to be a pal for them. So, and that's a friend, a buddy, comrade, or companion. So if our AC users are really going to be motivated and want to engage with us, um, we need to be that friend for them, somebody who's motivating and engaging naturally with them. Um, so they do want to communicate with us. All right, AAC, Augmentative and Alternative Communication. Again, it's that umbrella term. It encompasses the communication methods and tools that we use to supplement, to replace, maybe both our speech and our writing um, for production of comprehension or spoken or written language. So it's all those strategies and all those uh, ways that we use to communicate that isn't speech. It can supplement or replace speech and written language. And the communication bill of rights, we uh, really went into this on our first module, but we always like to bring it up. And if you haven't already printed this off, we encourage you to do so. Um, but printing off your communication bill of rights and making it visible to all who enter your rooms um, that our students um, who use AC definitely have rights to all of these different aspects of communication and participation in their therapy and education as well. All right, one more thing to keep in mind before we get into the modules. Um, how do you know if a student would benefit from AAC supports and strategies? So maybe you have a couple students on your caseload or in your classroom right now, they're not using AAC, but you're thinking, hmm, I wonder if AAC would be an appropriate strategy and support to provide them. So we like to think of just one question. Is their speech meeting their communication needs? And if you would answer that as no, then yes, they could benefit from AAC and good communication partner skills. So we're so glad that you're here today. All right, so we're going to jump into our first module, which is technically module number nine, Presume Potential. And Maggie, I love this. It's one of my favorite topics. I mean, my letter board at my cubicle has Presume Potential on it, and I never change it because it's just something that we always need to be reminded of and keep in my mind. I know I pass that when I'm going to the copier, so I always look at it. It's a great reminder to put up because I feel like it really is a mindset thing that can um, impact 
everything that we do as um, professionals, as educators. So really getting that and understanding it and thinking through it um, can really help us make some changes or some mind shifts that uh, can just help us and our students. So, all right, presume potential. Some key ideas here. This might be a new um, thing that you've heard, not heard before, or maybe you've heard it before. So let's get into it and discuss it a little bit. Presume potential means to acknowledge that all individuals have the ability to learn, the ability to communicate, and the ability to contribute in their own way. It also means that we, the educators, provide opportunities for this growth and for this learning and for this communication by creating accessible and inclusive spaces. So the importance of this statement is in the recognition that students can't showcase what their potential is. They can't showcase what they do know or what they have the potential to learn if opportunities aren't provided to them, right? We need to be creating and providing accessible and inclusive spaces so that they have the opportunity to learn and the opportunity to show us things. It is important to meet students where they're at, right? But we also want to assume that they will always progress beyond that place, that where they're at now is not where they're gonna stop learning. We are presuming potential means that we are realizing that all students are lifelong learners just like all people are lifelong learners. So we're presuming that we're giving um, accessible and inclusive spaces to make that happen. Um, it's also, so putting it another way, it's assuming that the individual will have the knowledge that their learning will never stop, regardless of the place that you start with. So it really is that mindset and putting that into action to demonstrate that um, we're presuming potential. Exactly, and we have a little video for you that we would love for you to watch here. Mm -hmm. How to define Rett syndrome? I, I've heard people say it's like a combination of autism, cerebral palsy, um, Tourette's, um, muscular dystrophy, ALS, kind of all rolled into one. And actually what I liken it to is somebody who has full capacity to understand language and has independent thinking and, and independent language um, in their heads. It's all in there, um, but they're trapped in their own bodies. The brain is screaming out that they want to say the words, but the pathways to the mouth or to the other muscles are just not working. With the apraxia in Rett syndrome, which I think is its cornerstone, it means I can tell my body to do something and it won't start doing it. Or I can tell my body to go right and instead it's going to go left. Or I can have my hands already going, 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 but I can't get them to stop. Our children are very much more capable cognitively than they were given credit for at first. Allowing possibilities people that are using AAC could achieve what their peers can achieve. It's just about finding the right way for them to do that. So by presuming competence, I put the full onus, the full responsibility of educating this child or helping this adult on me. finding a way for the person to communicate without having to use their hand or their mouth is key. And that's where I goes and using the eyes is the most important thing. Modeling a language is so important because if you don't model a language, then you can't expect someone to learn to speak a language. Don't look at all the things they cannot do. Because there's a whole bundle of things that they can do. You're showing them, you're demonstrating, and you're giving them an opportunity to respond every time. So you're showing them how to put the language together. What we always have to be asking ourselves is, can I make it easier for this person to do what everybody else is doing? Uh, 
I absolutely love this video mm -hmm. um, because, and a couple of things, like one where she talks about how don't focus on what they can't do, focus on what they can do and then move from there. And then also the presuming the potential, as you said earlier, Maggie, is a mind shift for us as educators. And it, as she said, like it's putting it on ourselves. Okay, what do we need to do to make this environment and communication accessible to this child? And then at the end where she, I like how she puts that growth mindset in there of like, okay, what do we need to keep doing to keep making this easier and more efficient for them? Um, we don't know what they wanna say or what they are capable of, um, but we also don't need to make assumptions of what they can or can't do until they are able to show us by us making that accessible for them. So the movies about presuming, or not movies, I guess, but video clips about presuming potential just always give me a little bit teary-eyed. <laughs> <laughs> or trying not to cry, but I totally agree with all of that. I love that part where she said, presuming potential means we as the educators are putting the onus on ourselves to figure out a way to best teach our students. That it really is thinking through, like, if something isn't working, we don't think of that as a learning failure, we think of it as a teaching failure. So we're always looking at ourselves to see what we need to do to help our students progress, and that we're just really looking at ourselves. So I love that part of it too. Such a good video clip. All right. All right. So uh, when we're looking again, presuming potential, again, keeping in mind that that really is coming to us providing accessible and inclusive opportunities. So quality of life, presuming potential creates richer and more meaningful interactions for the individuals who use AAC or those who present with any disability. The communication partners of those who use AAC and then others who observe interactions with those with disabilities. We are, um, when we're presuming potential, we are offering up opportunities that are meaningful and motivating and that is uh, beneficial for obviously our students, but also for us, for the people who are interacting with our students because we're creating a uh, more reciprocal and meaningful relationship. And I absolutely love this slide here. There's nothing in a caterpillar that tells you it's going to be a butterfly. Um, so I think that's just a good analogy to keep in mind that um, caterpillars do become butterflies without us knowing it. And our kids, they may not show us in the beginning what they're fully capable and what they can do, um, but we need to presume that it's there and then figure out a way for them to be able to show us. Yep. All right. All right, another video and this one is awesome and we're going to watch it and not cry. Uh, I cry every time. <laughs> I know. I'm going to cry too, but it's really good. <laughs> got a call from the neurologist and I have never felt such conflicting emotions in my life. It was like complete relief and complete devastation. It was just me there, friends at work, and I just sat there, what do I do? I spent a lot of time thinking about the life that wasn't going to be there anymore. I felt like things were all of a sudden taken away. In 2007, Becca was born and we were so excited and she was a perfect baby girl. She was perfect in every way. You know, we were just ecstatic. Our first kid, really excited about the whole thing. But when she got to be about a year old, we started to see that, you know, she was, she was behind. She would kind of fold in half and not be able to sit back up. She couldn't crawl anymore. It was getting too hard for her and she wasn't talking anymore. We were talking to a geneticist, but he didn't think it was anything genetic. It didn't seem to fit in any any of the molds that they were used to looking in. They decided to give her a few genetic tests. One of them came back positive, and it was rat syndrome. The advice from doctors and everyone was just make her comfortable, just make her happy, but don't expect a whole lot. And you hear doctors will say things like she might not live very long. It was very up in the air when they would talk to us. It was a, a lot to a lot to process, and I felt like she was not going to be able to have a very full life. 
until the International Rett Syndrome Conference was in Midway, Utah. And as we went, the message was very different. A lot of kids can learn to read. They can learn to learn just like regular kids. And so we came home from that conference uh, really feeling empowered, and we tried a bunch of things. We kind of picked up on that she would look at us for yes and look away for no. I made just a, a big page with a whole bunch of stuff. And the one that she ended up settling on was her car seat. And I said, oh, well, you're going to talk about your car seat. And she looked at me very deliberately and said, yes. And I said, do you like your car seat? And she very deliberately said, no. <laughs> and I said, oh, you don't like your car seat. That is a breakthrough moment because we didn't realize how, how normal she was. She just took off. She was excited. She was just so ready to talk to us. Within a year and a half, she was reading. Um, she was doing math on her own. So often we look at people with disabilities and we say, oh, let's help them be happy, but we don't know what to do with them. And if we can give those individuals a voice of their own, then it's not a question of what do I do with you. It becomes what do you want to do for yourself? There is technology that can help with that. There's computers that you can mount in front of somebody and they have a camera on them so they can watch where somebody's eyes go. And if they look at the same thing for a second or so, the computer says, oh, that's the same as if somebody touched it. And then the computer can say it out loud. Each person has a way of communicating. I never realized how much you could say with your eyes. These augmentative communication tools are a way for people whose voices may not be working to be heard. You have to look for a kind of um, reaction. A light turns on when she's understanding something. Having Becca in our lives is a blessing. I hate Red Syndrome, you know, and I would get rid of it in a heartbeat. I would love to see her walk in the door after school. The paths that we walk aren't always what we expect that they will be, but they can take us to a good place when we let them. Listening to me means putting everything out of the way, getting close to Becca and focusing. There's a lot of humility in listening and giving someone a voice is a show of love. I look forward to her being able to have long conversations with me. Being able to be heard is one of the most important privileges that we have. The reasons that we live on this earth are different than the things that we worry about. And if we can appreciate the beauty of what we get to experience, We'll see a lot more good. <laughs> so good. It's every so good. Time, I just love the part where the mom, that gets me every time. It's where she talks about um, that she looks forward to having long conversations with her daughter. Um, and then I like how they brought up to, uh, in our last module, I believe we talked about um, looking for the feedback mm -hmm. from the student to know if like what we're doing and what we're providing and teaching is hitting the mark and everything. Um, and she talks about that, like they have to look for a sign um, yeah. that the light goes off, um, whatever that means for them. They, they know the signal uh, that shows that she's understanding. So such a good video, so powerful. Such a good video and I think it just really sums up the importance and why we have to presume potential and make opportunities available knowing that we can't know what a student will learn so that we have to present all of the opportunities. Like they said, within a year then she was reading, she was writing. Um, and if they wouldn't have made those opportunities available, then a she won't learn them, you know, she's not going to learn to read and write if no one's teaching her. So they chose to teach her and she learned those skills. And then I don't know, like the first couple times I, I watched it, I probably was crying during this part, so I didn't catch it, but I caught it today. And he said, um, like providing, giving, helping uh, someone find a voice is an act of love. And I mean, what else can we want to do for our students, but to like help them 
<laughs> be able to tell us what's on their mind. We have to presume that potential and make it make it happen in every day. So, so good. So good. All right. So now we have some quotes um, from some parents that they wanted uh, to share for other parents of children with disabilities. And Maggie and I thought that these would be good just, again, to kind of share and ponder on and think of um, and what presumed potential really means uh, to different parties. So the first one is assume your child is aware and able to understand, even though they may not show this to you in a way that you are able to recognize it and understand it. And Maggie, I don't know about you, but there's been a couple of times for me in therapy where it just, a student is doing something and I don't catch it maybe the first couple of times, um, or maybe even more than that. But then all of a sudden one day it just connects and wow, like you're like, oh, you were trying to tell me this all along and I just wasn't catching it. Um, but, and then it shows you just how much they understand um, and what we need to do to change it. One of it, I guess it was um, from actually this past week, I, I think my most recent one was a student was kind of rehearsing years off the top of um, he was just verbalizing them. And I was like, why is he wanting to do years? Cause he was doing like 2014, 2017, 2019, 2021. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and um, I didn't know where he was going with it. And then he went into his device and he's using a Nova chat and goes into time and goes today is Tuesday, November 10th and can't say 2020 because it wasn't programmed in his thoughts. And the light bulb just went off for me because that's what he was telling me because that's something that he does every day. And um, his device had just came back from being repaired and for some reason, I guess it just was on a, a wrong year and nobody had caught it or like paid a, enough attention. And he, he knew that I was a person <laughs> that could help him fix it. And so he was letting me know. And so then we went through how to be able to say that to somebody and everything. But I was just like, oh my gosh, that's why you were saying those years and everything. Cause you were trying to get there to be able to tell me, Hey lady, fix this on my device. <laughs> and, um, so yeah, you just, you never know. So pay attention and, um, there's always something in there. I feel like there's always something hidden that uh, they're trying to tell us. All right. Another one is assume your child or the other person does and can understand when they are being spoken of and to. Um, I think of this a lot, like when you're in the room, you're doing therapy, include that child in your conversation. So if there's being a question asked about like, hey, they're doing a lot of exploring on their device during this time. Include that student in that conversation. Oh, you know, during circle time, it's not the time to explore um, so-and-so. Like we need, to, instead of talking about them right there with them, include them in that conversation because they know, they know that they're being talked about. Um, so we should give them that respect and make them a part of that conversation. Uh, and then the third one on this page is talk to your child or the other person as you would a same age. Um, this one, the parent said non-autistic child or person. So, you know, presuming that potential, treating them as an equal for sure. Um, more great points here. Um, I love this one. Read. After every single one, I'm like, that is the most important. And then you read the next one, I'm like, that one is. <laughs> and now we're here at this one and this one. Read and have available age-appropriate stories and give access and instruction to age-appropriate learning materials. So um, I feel like this is a huge one. If we are presuming potential, then we are presuming that all students are learning learning communication, learning literacy, learning to read, learning to write. Um, just like we would presume that for any kiddo right when they're born, we presume that they're gonna learn those skills, so we make opportunities available. It's the same at school. Like We need to presume that if we teach things, if we make things available, students will learn because we're gonna teach it in a way that they can learn. So yeah, having 
um, age appropriate stories, having accessible um, ways to write and making accessible writing opportunities just to work in all of those skills is huge and really goes to that mindset for us that we're presuming potential. So we're making accessible opportunities happen. Um, provide alternative and accessible ways to demonstrate learning. So this is like one that I think we're more familiar with now is that kind of universal design for learning that we um, know that students can show us that they understand something and more than just eight out of 10, they pointed receptively and that's how they show us that um, you can demonstrate learning in lots of different ways. And for um, some, for some students, like we need to, if they show us something once, that means they can do it and we move on. They don't, we don't have to drill it anymore. We don't have to test it anymore. We're not looking for them to do it four out of five opportunities for three days in a row. They show it to us one time. We're, we're saying, yes, they showed us they can do it. Check mark and we move on to the next skill uh, because we're presuming that potential that they can continue to grow and to learn. So I love all those points too. And look at those awesome accessible uh, learning things down there, those materials and Love it. All right, some more um, thoughts to kind of reflect on would be presumptions of competence or potential means that you're treating the other person with respect and as an equal without pity or infantilization. Um, this one is big. It's like you're not you're not just doing it to make it look good, like you're doing it truly for that person and the benefit of them um, to help them grow and to help them be able to communicate and become um, an equal member of a society. Um, another one, it does not mean that we will carry expectations that if not met will cause us to admonish, scold, or assume the person is being manipulative or just needs to try harder. Um, I think that's a good one too to kind of reflect on um, as well. I think it goes kind of to that where you take that as a um, teaching failure, not a learning failure. It's, you know, on us then that we need to go back and figure out what we need to change and how we're presenting things so that uh, the student can um, be able to access it in a different way because it's on us. We have to do that. And we keep coming back to that, that word access, like it really does, it comes down to how can they access communication efficiently? How can they access, you know, academic material um, efficiently? Um, the ability to read and write. And like you said, providing those opportunities in the video, they talked about that. Once they started providing access and providing those opportunities, um, then you'll see the growth and you'll see them start to show us all kinds of things. Yeah. All right, so here's this video. Um, this is Lance McLemore. I think mm -hmm. I'm saying his last name right. Maggie and I had the immense pleasure of being able to see him live for a presentation um, this year, actually, at ATIA uh, back in January. And he's such a great speaker. He uses LAMP Words for Life, um, and he's an ambassador for PRC. Um, but this video is just great. It's at a camp, I believe, an AC camp, um, and he's communicating with another AC user. Oh, really? Oh, really? You were. See, that shows you how bad my hair is. Chase, Chase, each other around. You were chasing each other around. I probably am. I probably am. Yes. Hey. Hi. Hey. 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 
November. Well, mine is November 12. Not much. No, not much. No. All right. So, just those two A C users. How we just like it. it was, yeah, they're he, and I think he's just demonstrating like total presuming potential. Like he's being a master pal. <laughs> like he is using great communication partner skills. He is presuming that she can understand him. Mm -hmm. uh, he isn't talking to her in a different way because she's younger and. Mm -hmm. um, or he thinks she's younger, you know, he's just talking to her like he would any student. Um, he's presuming that she can understand him and she, he gives her a great wait time so that she I was just going to say too for our next topic here in this module, he's an he's awesome not, example. Yeah, so like that's what we should all, like that's what I'm going to, that's what I'm striving to be. I'm trying, striving, striving to be a master pal like he is being right now. So awesome video. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we have some do's and don'ts, don'ts for presuming potential with accessible inclusive opportunities. So some do's, be respectful in your words. Make sure your words are kind and not condescending. Um, we kind of touched on this a little bit before too. Um, with your tone of voice as well, a lot can be communicated non-verbally through our tone of voice. So being very cognizant of that and that you're compassionate or just very objective in what you're saying um, versus having that exasperated tone to them. Because just like they know if they're being talked about, they're going to pick up on that you're not really wanting to communicate or that you're getting... Um, exasperated and like, I don't know, I'm losing my words here. <laughs> um, it would be, it's true. Yeah. Um, and then also be respectful in your actions. Um, so a lot of this is like making sure that if we're doing circle time or any kind of group activity that we're turning individuals in their wheelchairs so that they're towards the conversation. Because if they can't see that we're talking to them, they're not going to be able to fully participate. Um, so making sure that like we're all inclusive and in how we're doing that and opportunities um, as well. Um, and then other do's would be alert individuals of what you are doing to them or with them during personal care and positioning. So um, whenever it goes to helping them with their personal care and hygiene items, um, just being able to talk to them and let them know step by step what's going on and or having a conversation with them too during that time. So letting them know what you're gonna do, what's going on, um, but then also participating like you would anybody else. Um, during medical visits and procedures, again, step by step, identifying what you're gonna do um, and allowing them the opportunity to become an active participant as well in their own medical care. Um, and then just transitions and activities, you know, visual schedules definitely help with this, but again, letting them know like, hey, in one minute, we're going to stop doing this and then it's going to be time for this or whatever the activity is going to be. This is what we're going to be doing during the activity, showing them a picture of what the finished product is going to be, just helping them in any way that we can to make them more successful during that activity. Um, and then ask permission to share information about them with others. Um, Maggie and I have um, done this a lot with like data logging or like any time that we're going to go and program a device, making sure that we're asking the student and making them an active participant um, as well. So is it okay if I take a look at your device and see why it's not charging? Is it okay if I add this word to your device? Um, asking their permission because that is their voice. Um, we don't need to just take it and do whatever we're going to do on it. 
it's theirs. So we need, we wouldn't want somebody like grabbing my purse <laughs> without asking me. I'd be a little like, wait, what's going on? <laughs> uh, so we need to treat that um, the same for them and asking them uh, permission before we do anything like that. Yes. So a lot of those do's filter in right to these don'ts. So don't talk about individuals in front of them without their permission. Again, it's checking in with them, making them part of this um, part of this conversation because we're presuming that they're understanding everything that we're saying. Um, so we're presuming that they would understand anything we're saying about them if we're talking about them to somebody else. So ask for them, ask that permission first. Don't assume that they don't understand what you were saying. Um, just because we might not be able to um, understand the ways that they're showing that they're understanding doesn't mean that they're not understanding. So again, that presuming potential is just having that, as that assumption that they are understanding what we're saying. Don't assume you know what they want. And this is, this can be tricky sometimes because we might feel like we do and maybe we've been working with the student for so long that we've picked up on their um, non-symbolic ways of communicating. So like um, body language, we're like, oh, we know what that means. And that can be true. But again, we want to um, go beyond that and we want to do like we talked about before, that verbal referencing, giving it meaning, putting it in context um, so that we are reflecting back to them what we're seeing so that we're being respectful to them and we're presuming that that is um, they have the ability to grow in that skill. So we're providing that opportunity. Oh, this is a good one. Don't dismiss refusal as noncompliance. <laughs> Their refusal could be then communicating no. <laughs> so we want to honor their no as much and as best as we can um, because that is um, a way for them to communicate. And that kind of goes into this one below it. Don't assume an individual's behavior is a deliberate choice. Um, there can be so many different reasons um, that we're seeing a certain thing. Maybe they're not feeling good today. Maybe um, they're really hot or they're really thirsty or um, this is the only way right now that they have the ability to communicate um, whatever emotion or feeling or thought that they're having right now. So um, thinking through those things first, you know, not just assuming that it's a deliberate choice, it's all feeding into that mindset of us presuming potential. Um, and those are some good do's and don'ts to think through. And then that leads us into all of this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. It, as Ma Maggie keeps saying, it's a mindset yeah. for us as educators. And whatever your mindset is going to be, there's going to be that self-fulfilling prophecy that goes with it. So if you think that the child is only going to be able to reach and be able to do certain things um, for whatever reason, you're more than likely not going to make it really accessible. Um, you're not going to keep having that growth mindset of what can I keep doing to make them efficient. You're not going to be providing as many opportunities and therefore they're, they're only going to achieve what you think that they can achieve because of that reason. But if we think, okay, we're going to do whatever we can to get this kid to be able to read, to write, to be able to become an efficient communicator and a well-rounded communicator. You're going to do whatever you have to to make materials accessible for them for all of those areas. You're going to make sure that you're providing a plethora of opportunities and then therefore you're going to see them rise um, and really uh, become capable and should be able to show you all kinds of things that you never thought before. I think we see this in our everyday life too, just with ourselves, like those little things at the bottom. Like if we wake up and we're like, I'm going to have a terrible day today, <laughs> the day's more likely to go terrible versus if you wake up and you're like, you know what, today I'm going to make it a good day. You have a better day. It's that feeding that loop of expectation, driving what happens and then the outcome. So I just... I, I love, love this. that metaphor, yes, and connecting those two. That is so true and realistic and applicable for everybody yeah. because we all have those days. For sure. It goes into this. I mean, our biases will shape our behavior. So whether they're, um, whatever biases they are, they shape what our perception is and what we are doing. It shapes then what behavior we're doing. So um, 
thinking through that, kids know when we respect them and when we don't. So we um, really need to work on fostering that engagement piece um, because again, kids pick up on these things. Um, I love this one. Are we eliciting compliance or are we eliciting engagement? Um, engagement has to happen for learning to happen. And then engagement increases motivation, which then increases learning, right? So engagement, learning, and motivation to communicate emerges from these positive interactions that we're having. Compliance, when we are making or trying to get a kid to do something because we told them to do it, that undermines all of that. And it undermines engagement. It undermines motivation. So it undermines learning. And then does our behavior honor the student's emotional need or our emotional state? Um, so self-awareness of our ability to handle a situation is important. Um, there's no judgment in tapping out. Um, I had this happen today with my own child as I was dropping him off for, for school. Um, I could tell that we were running, right? Running a little late, so my emotional state was not at a place to maybe handle uh, things appropriately. So I needed to send him off and be like, goodbye. I needed to tap out because I could tell that you know our next interaction probably would be emotion uh, would be honoring my emotional state, <laughs> you know, allowing me to express my frustration that we were running late instead of honoring his emotional need. So um, there's no ex there's no problem taking a break, taking you know, stepping out of a situation because um, that's where we always want to be. We don't want to be, um, we don't want to be honoring our emotions. So we want to be honoring the student's emotions. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with tapping out. I know that they talk a lot about this with CPI um, yeah. as well. Is that like you, if you need to tap out, you need to tap out. And like, that's, you know, the thing to do. And so not being afraid to do that as well. Being very aware, as you said. Yes. Going with all right something else to think about is ability positive language so we've kind of talked about you know how to shift your mindset and how you think um and do's and don'ts of what to say but here's some more ability positive language so descriptive rather than presumptive presumptive language so um and maggie and i talk about this if you've ever been to our reading material session or make and take but instead of saying that he's not a reader like if he's seeking out books or if we're even chewing on books like we're exploring books um he's seeking out books focusing again as i said in that first video of what they can do and what they are doing and you know that's not that emergent level of reading um we're interacting with them so instead of saying oh he's not able to read like focus on what they are doing and what, where we can go from there um recognizing potential areas of growth rather than a lack of skills so he hasn't shown us that yet instead of he can't do that we don't know that he can't do that unless we've provided him with access to it and access that we know works or lots of opportunities so it probably is more than likely actually 100 percent is that he hasn't shown us that yet um because of those other reasons because again that presuming the potential falls on us as the educator um and then recognizing that it is the responsibility of us as the educators to think outside of the box um, and to explore what a child requires to gain those skills so again we've been talking a lot about making it accessible and doing what we have to to figure out what they need um, and providing them with those opportunities in order for us to show them to show us that skill. Um, so this one I love a lot, that she is yeah. complex, or sometimes I'll say, they're a puzzle. <laughs> it's like my go-to, it's like, they're a puzzle for me. And we're still figuring out how they learn or how they're gonna best communicate um, versus she is so low. Um, so because it is it's it's on us we're we're still having to figure out we're still trialing we're doing different things so we're just we're still figuring it out 
And I love this because language is so powerful. So the language that we're using really reflects kind of some of our thought process, but then also impacts like the other educators that we're talking to. So if yep. we would say um, he's an emergent literacy learner, he is seeking out books. Uh, when he gets crayons, he scribbles. We are setting that tone <laughs> that we believe he's going to increase his skills versus he's not a reader. That's just kind of shutting the door on any learning opportunities. And I just, these are such simple changes. Um, it, so at first, they might need a lot of attention, like you really have to pay attention at first, but then, but that's something that we're just controlling. We have the ability to change how we say something. And just by saying something slightly different, we're changing everyone's perception of that student. And then we're like going to be creating these opportunities for the student just by how we say something. It's just so exciting to me <laughs> that we have the ability to do that with such a simple just change of how we say something. So. For sure. We're the gatekeepers, remember? I was yeah. trying to think back yeah. to, yeah. If we're the gatekeepers and we have a really big responsibility to make sure we are uh, <laughs> keeping the gate open, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Versus I don't share. Share. Yeah. For sure. Um, and I think it all goes into this. So setting the bar high. So perception drives expectation. So if we have the perception that this student is a lifelong learner, because all students are lifelong learners, that's going to drive our expectation. And if we have an expectation that this student's going to learn, then we're going to be providing opportunities for that child to learn. Obviously, they need to anybody needs an opportunity to do something in order to learn and to grow and to achieve it. And that achievement then drives our perception, it drives everyone else's perception, it drives that student's own perception of themselves as a lifelong learner. So really it's kind of that chicken and the egg thing, right? Like you have to uh, start here and it has to go around and then it feeds into each other in a loop. So if our perception is low, our expectations are gonna be low, opportunities are gonna be low, and then obviously achievement would be low because we didn't provide opportunities and expectations. So I just love keeping that in mind. And from Practical AAC, one of our favorite places to go to learn. For sure. All right, and we can't know uh, what our kids know if they don't have a way to tell us. So we keep circling. <laughs> yeah. Get around to this. Uh, but just all comes back to this. So we, uh, talk about that, you know, we don't have a magic wand or here it says like we don't have a magical power to be able to know what a student is going to be able to their achievements and everything. Um, so it's on us again as the educators. This is the weight that we bear that it's on us to think outside of that box to teach them um, with multiple modalities and in different ways um, to demonstrate uh, their language, speak our words on their AC system, and communicating. We have to keep that whole trial and error process. If something doesn't work, you don't just abandon it, you keep at it, or you try something new, give it some time to be able to work. You just keep trial and erroring until we find something that does make the academics and communication accessible to our students. And then a plethora of opportunities for them to then have those achievements. Um, and then one last thing, although I'm sure this will get, <laughs> this will infiltrate all the other modules <laughs> because it really does feed into everything else that we'll do, um, is to presume incompetence. So to presume that there isn't a lot of learning potential, that presuming that, you know, our students have a, like a level of what they're going to reach and we can't go beyond that is to actively do damage. So I feel like that, I remember when, um, like learning about this term for the first time and thinking, yeah, like if I, that perception, driving expectation, driving opportunities, if we don't have that high, perception, um, we're doing damage because we're not providing opportunities to learn. Um, so rule number one, do no harm. Let's just, this is a simple mindset. I mean, it takes some time and it really, you know, sometimes whenever you're making a change, even a mindset, you have to really be active and explicit in it. You have to catch yourself thinking something and stop that thought and change that thought to be positive thought, right? But we can get there and then um, 
we're not, we're not actively doing this damage. We're not harming our fellow human beings, which is all, all, all of our goals. So it's just a little final thing to, to, to think about for this topic. Mm -hmm. All right, and then to wrap up, the presumed potential module is um, AC is that umbrella term again, and it means many things um, when we're talking about receptive expressive language and communication. Modeling or aided language input means that you're going to speak your words on that child's AC system um, in order to teach them that language. And then assuming each child will learn, communicate, and contribute to the community is presuming that potential. Using ability positive language with he will, she likes, they can is very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and like Maggie said, it just sets the tone right from the beginning. Respect the child, use language and interaction behaviors that foster engagement rather than compliance. We don't want a test answer situation or I do this, you do this. We want that engagement. That goes back to that whole master pal. You know, we have this set of skills, but we're also your kind of your buddy and your comrade that you're gonna want to engage with. And then presuming potential, as Maggie just um, said, is to do no harm. We are actively not gonna do harm by presuming potential for our children, students and AC users. Yep. And then that flows us into our next module um, that we're going to do. I think this is module number six, technically, is time. And time means two different things. It's going to include wait time or think time and then time for language to develop. And we're going to go in depth into both of these. All right, so time, it takes time to learn language. Um, so we're gonna get right into language development and break it down a little bit. So definitions, language development is a process that occurs over time, years and years and years. In response, because of things that are happening um, in the environment, right? So in response to motivation, interactions that are inherent to um, that environment and the relationships that are around that child. So the process of language development is characterized by expansion of communicative purpose. Like we're gonna communicate for a variety of reasons. Maybe we start with requesting and protesting, but then we're gonna comment. We're going to answer questions, ask questions. We're going to have social closeness. Um, acquisition of vocabulary, there's a big vocabulary burst that happens over um, a long period of time for students. And for children, um, combining words to create meaning and change meaning and integration of syntax. But these things, this takes time. All right. And so, as Maggie started, <laughs> the language development occurs over time. So, if you think about a child, either your own children um, as they were growing up or are growing up, um, or just children, nieces or nephew, anybody, um, zero to five in your life in the past or the present. So, their first words are usually very motivating and powerful to get their wants and needs met. Um, usually, fringe words like ball or dad. Um, up they start to come up with then they start to get in some fun phrases as they go along that can be not so fun when they get older and then just think about their growth of um, in interactions from whenever they're a year and a half to three year olds to five year olds and what they're really able to communicate to you um, at those different ages as well and just how it grows and continues to develop um, in complexity and efficiency as they learn more words and learn how to put those words together to make really meaningful utterances to be able to participate in conversations um, over time. So when we are looking at um, using AAC supports and strategies, we really want to go back to language development to help us guide that process and help us guide interventions and how, um, you know, what things that we're looking at. Language is acquired in a relatively predictable fashion. It's characterized by gradual increases in communicative intents, 
use of symbolic communication. So moving away from gestures, which are non-symbolic, to symbolic, so words, written language, symbols. Um, vocabulary repertoire, so we're increasing our vocabulary. We're getting in lots of different language groups their um, utterance length, putting words together longer, use of language patterns. So all of that's happening though over the course of many, many, many years. And it reflects a child's environment, culture, dialect. It's learned through, de um, it's learned through demonstration and natural context. So it's happening throughout the day during motivating meaningful opportunities and where the adults around the student or the, around the child are demonstrating all of this different language skills and things. All right. And then over that time, as their language continues to develop, they're going to learn to communicate for a variety of purposes as well um, as their language continues to develop. So in the beginning, it's really just about like requesting usually, um, refusal, maybe some commenting at what they see and drawing your attention to it, and maybe some social closeness and wanting to share um toys with you for you to play with them sharing different experiences together but then as time goes as their language continues to develop they learn how to put more words together um, to make longer utterances and as that time goes on then they start to learn how to put those words together to be able to form and ask questions how to respond to important um, information at school and demonstrate their academic knowledge and then to be able to really uh, share and show information about themselves, um, about things that they know. So language develops, but it takes time. All of those skills come over a long period of time and they continue to develop and be refined. Um, we've touched on this in different modules, but it really is how language is developed. It's shaped by communication partner feedback. So when um, a student says something, a child says something, um, our, um, the way we react to it and the way we shape it helps to build up those language skills. So um, looking at this, um, a lot of students will develop, a lot of, I keep saying students, students, children, <laughs> they um, may start using some nouns early on to communicate because they're really motivating and meaningful. So cut mama, ball, um, they're motivational, they give us our wants and our needs, but then we start to see um, some core words come into those early words soon after, very quickly after a couple of nouns, so up, go, want, no. <laughs> um, so they, we need to have a variety of different words though to be able then to start putting words together that we see here, some core plus fringe going together. Up, ball, here mama, get cup. And then we can use these combinations to direct actions, but also to uh, request our wants and needs. Then we keep building up on language over time and after vocabulary growth. So we again, a student as the child is learning lots of different vocabulary words and lots of different um, groups of, of words to put more words together. No, do it. I go up. I want big one to, again, for lots of different um, reasons and functions for communication. But down here at the bottom, we see a long phrase. But we didn't get there right at the beginning. We had to start with single words and we had to start by um, getting a vocabulary of over 50 words before we start putting two words together, right? And then we have to get a bigger vocabulary before we start putting three words together. That is normal language development, whether you are learning your native language or you are learning a second language, including AAC. All right, and again, language development is our guide for teaching AAC. Um, when we think about our kids and their learning the words, as Maggie was just talking about, we're always modeling one up. We just naturally do it. If they say up, we say, oh, you want up. If they say ball, we say, yeah, that's a big ball that we're going to play with or bounce the ball. We automatically add another one or two words um, to what that child says or that um, a user says. 
Um, so, and it's the same thing, whenever we are using the AC system, um, if they tell us one word on the AC system or however they choose to communicate to us, we're automatically going to recast that back to them and add another couple of words to be able to teach them the vocabulary and teach them how these words go together to make um, a more efficient message and more complete message. Um, and with that, we're also modeling appropriate grammatical forms when possible. Mm -hmm. So that's where those verb tenses come into play with, you know, the past tense and present progressive and showing them how to add those on to, again, just be better at describing what's going on um, and make a more complete and full message. We also need to provide a good verbal language model as well. So even whenever we are recasting and um, demonstrating back to our children, um, providing that aided language input using their AC system and adding that word on, we may only add one word that we're providing that demonstration for and that aided language input, but when we're saying it, we're saying a complete sentence for them so that they're hearing auditorily um, a complete, nice, cohesive, grammatically correct sentence, or if it's appropriate to be able to use simple language, but they're still carrying something that's correct and complete um, for them. We're also adding that intonation whenever we're verbally saying it to help indicate that if it's a question um, or if we're really excited and have lots of enthusiasm for what's going on or if we're disappointed and not excited about what's going on, they're getting the full package when we're providing that aided language input by being able to see and learn new words that we're providing that aided language input for, but then also to be hearing that quality that goes with those messages as well. So again, looking at language development to help us guide our teaching of AAC. So it's uh, taking what Gina just said and showing it in a nice little graph form here. So the child's utterance, they say go. So us as the communication partner will expand that while demonstrating how to put two words together. We're doing that one up go out. But again, we're going to be doing that on, we're going to demonstrate those words on the AAC system. We're going to provide aided language input for them while we're speaking a full sentence. So the child says go, we're going to say you want to go out. <gasps> Me too. Um, help. They say one word. So we are going to demonstrate how to put one more word together with that on their AAC system while we verbally speak uh, you know, a shortened phrase, but while we're doing a complete phrase. So student says help, we say help open. So let me help you open it. So we're demonstrating the AAC learning and we're giving the verbal speech as well. So like Gina said, the whole package. So you see some other examples here. So if they say one word on the AAC system, we are demonstrating how to do two words through aided language input of two words while we're verbally saying a phrase, but it might be like a shortened phrase too, you know, like, where is the ball? It's not a long, you know, 20 word sentence. It's a small sentence to help with that processing piece as well. Well, and because we also, um, this was a hard concept for me to initially learn. We speak telegraphically too yeah. sometimes whenever we're communicating yeah. just for efficiency. And we need to allow our children that and show them that that's okay. Sometimes it is just gonna be a short phrase and it's not gonna be a nice complete sentence every time that we communicate. Um, Cause that's not how we do do it naturally. I think about that like when, um, like if you ask your kid at home, like what do you want to drink? Milk, like that works, you yeah. know? One word's fine sometimes, right? So yeah, Exactly. Yeah. If it's appropriate for us to get away with it, it's definitely appropriate for them to get away with. And so we need to show that through our aided language input too. All right. So then if we think about um, with this whole language development and how it takes time, think about our, again, go back to those children that we talked about when we first introduced this module and how their language was, you know, whenever they were um, a year, year and a half, three, and then five years. In the beginning, when they're babies, they are babbling. 
Um, and they start to learn how to say words whenever they're babbling, they're exploring those sounds, and we respond to those sounds. We teach them what those sounds that they're saying mean. Um, so if they're going mama, 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 yeah, mama, you said mama, look, I'm your mama, mama loves you, yeah, mama, look, you're going to go show them, <laughs> look, they said mama. Um, we are giving them that enthusiastic reply, we're repeating it, we're adding words onto it, we're teaching them what that word says. If they say ba, and they're play and there's a ball nearby we're going yeah you said ball look ball i'm gonna bounce the ball we're playing with the ball we teach them the language by how we respond to them and what they're doing um when they're exploring with those sounds it is the exact same for ic users um so they will babble on the device um they're exploring it it's deliberate it's them learning where those words are, how they get to those words, what those words sound like when they press this um, sequence of pictures and this comes out, what is that word? And they're going to learn, further learn it by us responding to it. So if they're going through and they're saying fork, yeah, fork, we eat with a fork, don't we? We have to respond to what they say on the device and try and apply some meaning to it. If it's nearby, that's great. If it's not, it's be like, yeah, there's a, we have forks in the kitchen, don't we? Because we eat with the forks, but we may be in a complete, like in the car and there's no forks in the car, but we're still going to respond to what they're saying and try and get some meaning to it. And I think this kind of goes back to my story, um, even though he was verbally saying it, but sometimes when they're saying and trying to find words, they're, they don't know always where the word that they want is. And so they're kind of exploring and finding the word, but we need to respond to them. And then we will find what they were trying to communicate to us. Um, babbling is not stimming on their device. It is them learning on their device. So yes, there are times when it's, maybe not so appropriate during circle time and everything. And so then we just treat that the same that, oh, it's time to uh, turn the voice down on the device or we're listening, we're not talking on our device and everything, but that is them learning. So you can't take that away, you can't dismiss it. Um, it's them learning and we need to respond to it just like we would our other children, our typically developing children, to be able to help them learn that language. I think this really too goes back to presuming potential because when babies are babbling, we're presuming that that's how they're learning language. So we yeah. respond, respond in kind, right? So presuming potential that our kiddos that are AAC learners, that when they are babbling on their device, that that is a way for them to learn. Like that's just, it's up here in our brain that we're deciding that's a way for them to learn. So I'm going to respond to that to help shape it and to teach it and to realize that that's a way to learn language. So I think it really kind of harkens back to what we just talked about. Ties in for sure. This whole series. It, it does, doesn't it? It all ties in together. It does. So another developmental language thing that we see children doing um, to help like learn language and learn behaviors is that self-talk. So um, if you've seen like little two and three year olds um, playing even alone, especially alone, it's kind of noisy play, right? Because they're still um, really they, they talk out loud to themselves. And although that kind of starts to fade away, it doesn't go completely away. That still happens. My nine-year-old, he'll be in there playing sometimes and he is self-talking and making, you know, stories up and talking out loud to himself. It's that self-talk. It's something that um, we do as language learners. It's our outward vocalizations of word, phrases, thoughts, ideas. We observe it in young children. It starts to fade away, but like I said, it doesn't go completely away. And then, I don't know about you, but now that I'm aging in my, <laughs> I do all this <laughs> to keep myself on track now as an adult. So it comes back to us. It is just something that we do. Um, like I said, they'll start to internalize language. It becomes less self-evident, but it is still there. So AAC users, the important part why we're bringing this up is that we're probably gonna see that as well in our AAC users, our AAC learners, 
they're going to engage in that self-talk too. And it's an important piece of learning their AAC language because it gives them ownership of their voice. They get to hear that output and hear that voice and make that connection that this is a way for them to communicate their thoughts and needs and feelings. So it gives them ownership there. It's a way for them to explore the device, to learn to navigate with increasing purpose. Sometimes that, like you, uh, Gina, have you ended this where you're like, you have kiddos that kind of teach themselves where some vocabulary is because they're exploring it and self-talk. And I'm like, I know I did not teach you that word because oh, yeah. I didn't know that was. <laughs> so there's that, it's a way that we're learning language. It improves understanding of the world by generating and repeating meaningful words and phrases. We all do that when we've learned something new, we repeat it um, with different people in different contexts. Um, because we're learning that and we're kind of internalizing it. And again, we go back to babbling's not stimming, self-talk is not stimming. It is a totally normal expected part of language. It is developmentally appropriate. It is how we learn to use language. So we should expect to see that and to know that that is just something that students who use AAC, they're gonna do that as they're learning. We want to see it because that means they're progressing in their language development. For sure. All right, so then we come to where we kind of touched on this when we talked about the babbling, um, that it can be disruptive though sometimes whenever they're either doing self-talk or they are babbling and exploring on the AC device. Um, we need to remember that this is their voice. That AC system is their voice and their way of communicating. So for any student who verbally communicates, we can't take their voice away from them. So it's the same with the AC system. We should not be taking it away because that's their voice. We need to treat it like we would any other student, how we would redirect to them um, or how we would approach them in that situation. So when we can, responding to the language that they're generating, because again, that's going to be teaching them those words. So um, get, if we're doing circle talk, I kind of always go back to this because I feel like it's always a situation I get asked about the most uh, for AC users that I work with as well in classrooms. But during circle time, if you know they talk about hedgehog, and there is nothing about hedgehog to do with that activity. There's not a pet in the classroom that's a hedgehog. They don't have a pet of a hedgehog. You can't think of any reason why we would be talking about hedgehog right now. Be like, yeah, I know you like hedgehogs and we can talk about hedgehogs later, but right now we need to listen to like the story or we need to listen to the song or the words that we're talking about or the weather. Um, so just responding to them, acknowledging that language that they're using, but then teaching them that it's just not the appropriate time for us to be talking about that um, during this time. Recognizing that there may be some unmet sensory needs and what we need to do about that. So if we need to build in some more breaks um, during that time that maybe if they're going to their device that auditorily or visually, um, whatever sensory system, they may just be getting overloaded and then this is their way to focus on it um, as well. There is a student um, that Maggie has had and now I have that he will flip through vocabulary pages. And I'm starting to think that the times that I've seen him do it so far is times when I think he's a little bit more anxious um, about something that maybe is going on. And so recognizing that that may be a reason that he's trying to communicate to us because he's trying to find a word, he can't find it, but he's flipping through these vocabularies on his device. Um, and taking that as a sign and then seeing what we can do about it. Um, redirect to another activity or structured interaction. So again, redirecting back to activity, like the example that I gave with the circle time, or redirecting just back to the interaction, like, oh, it's not time to be um, talking about whatever it is they're hitting on their device. It's not time to talk about shapes right now. <laughs> We're talking about um, the weather. Um, give time and a space away from the group um, to be able to chat. So if um, we need to go aside with a paraprofessional, classroom aide, or if they can go aside with another peer and have time that's dedicated to them just exploring and looking at the device and being able to have that time to do that self-talk and um, do that babbling and everything, that they have time built into their day that is just for that, um, for them as well. 
Um, I love all those points, but I love that point about the sensory needs because I feel like that isn't always for me that I'm like, oh, I don't always think to myself, huh, I wonder. And again, I think it just goes to presume potential, like think through the things. Well, why is it? It's not that the student is trying to be disruptive. You know, there's a reason to this. And again, like we already said, we expect to see it because we know it's a normal language development, but just some questions to think through are always nice. And I just liked that point about the sensory needs because I feel like that's something that I don't always like doesn't always pop into the forefront of my mind. So I like that one a lot. Um, and then here's some other concrete strategies that you can try when it's like it's disruptive. It feels disruptive to the class. So um, build in those routines and strategies. So going off of this circle time example, um, what would you do for any other student that is talking out, right? We teach routines and we teach strategies for when it's time to not be talking and listening. So maybe the student, you're, you know, you're teaching students, you have to raise your hand first before you say something. And then how often is a student raising their hand, you ask, and then they say something off topic because it's there, they want to ask what's in their mind. So it would be the same way for our students who use AAC, but we're teaching that you need to raise your hand first. That's a routine that we try to build in. Maybe you wear a little wristband that when you raise your hand, it says, I have something to say. So then the teacher knows you want to ask it. Um, it could be that maybe there are times where we use a manual communication board. Um, we've said like, you know, just because a student or is using um, a high tech device doesn't mean that there aren't times that a manual communication board isn't being used as well. Um, maybe you're practicing the routine and strategy of a stop sign. So during circle time, if a student is speaking out, you know, you give them a visual. Right now we're not talking, we're listening. So there's lots of different things in here. And something I kind of just go back to too, it's like um, when we're thinking about anything that a student's doing with AAC, just replace that with, a, with any student. So like this AAC therapy is language therapy. So AAC is language. So what would you be doing for any student that's using their language during <laughs> circle time? It's the same thing. We don't, you know, we don't take that language away. We work in routines and strategies to help that student learn how to, you know, be part of the group. So be mindful. It's the voice. Any action should be thoughtful and respectful. Just some different ideas there. I love the bracelets though. And how fun. I know. <laughs> like, okay. so All right. <laughs> and continuing on with how it's disruptive its strategies. Um, taking away an individual's voice again, we want to reiterate this because um, it's very important. It's just not an option. Um, you shouldn't do it. It may be convenient, but it should not be done. Um, we have to teach them how to appropriately interact during those different situations. Um, so helping our students to learn how to use their communication tools. Again, it's a developmental process. It's going to take time. Again, we don't have a magic wand, just like we talked about during the presumed potential module. We, we wish we did sometimes, man, just to be able to wave over our magic wand, but we don't. So it takes time, it's a developmental process. It may be disruptive at times, but that's also why the great thing about working in schools um, is that we have a village at our hands and it takes a village to do this. Um, you know, it's going to take the paraprofessionals or the program aides, the classroom aides, the teacher. Um, it's gonna take, you know, our gen ed teachers, our special education teachers. It's gonna take our administrators who come in and interact with our AAC users. Um, all the related service personnel that come in and the peers as well um, in the classroom. It takes a village and all of us working collaboratively and cooperatively to be able to accomplish this. All right, and then wait time. This is another big period of time and we're gonna get into this into more depth later on as well, but touching on it, wait time. It's the period of silence when we are not talking between, between the time a question is asked and one responds to that question. Um, this is always an interesting one because wait time can feel really uncomfortable for us. Our brains are not wired to like have awkward silences, but this is where we're going to talk about getting okay with feeling a little awkward. <laughs> it's okay. So <laughs> I know it's getting, what is your saying that we always uh, talk about? Comfortable with being uncomfortable, you yeah. know? <laughs> 
totally it's okay. good to play here because this can be, as you said, the most awkward and uncomfortable it's so important. period. It can take so yeah. in our heads, it takes longer than what it really is. All right, so wait time is think time. So if um, gen ed teachers would provide at least three seconds of wait time, the average is less than a, a second and a half. But if they would even just wait a second and a half more to where it was three full seconds of wait time before accepting a student's response to a question that they um, proposed, the length of correctness of students' responses increases. The number of students who volunteer um, with appropriate answers uh, by larger numbers of students greatly <laughs> increases. Can I repeat myself there? Teacher questioning strategies tend to be a little bit more varied and flexible as well. And teachers increase the quality and quantity and variety of their questions. This is so true because I can even think about during my therapy that whenever I just zip it <laughs> and wait, I think of better questions. If I'm doing a book, I think of more open-ended questions. I start using a variety of WH questions instead of getting stuck on like just what or just yes, no. Like it it's powerful for our students, as it says in this example, um, to give them that think time, time to process, time to really think about what was asked and what their answer should be. Um, but it's good for us as educators because then we're improving the questions that we ask our teaching style. Just everything that we do gets better when we do this awkward wait time, think time. <laughs> So it's worth it. It is so it's worth it. it. It is. It's so worth it. All right. And now we have this video that is awesome. So we'll watch it and then we will. One of the easiest ways to identify a master teacher is by observing how well they utilize wait time when asking questions. This is because the technique of using wait time is a little counterintuitive. Most teachers feel that when students answer questions quickly, that means they have mastered the learning being assessed. But this is rarely true. Here's why. Every time a student's brain recalls prior learning on its own, that information is reinforced. If a question is asked and then quickly answered without letting the brain have time to recall the answer on its own, then that recall process is disrupted and the learning is not reinforced. So, when a teacher asks a question to a class of 20 students, 20 brains go to work trying to answer that question. But every one of those brains processes at a different speed. If the answer is given too quickly, some of the brains in the room will stop trying to find the answer. Allowing the question to be answered too quickly short circuits that recall process. By providing an extra 20, 30 seconds, sometimes even a minute, teachers provide students with that extra needed time for processing. One variation of this technique is called narrated wait time. This technique allows the teacher to extend wait time while keeping students' attention. What the master teacher understands is that while wait time is counterintuitive and sometimes feels awkward, giving plenty of time for processing is the key to maximizing effective questioning. So two things I like how they brought up, it's awkward because it is, that's why, <laughs> I mean, two seconds of wait time feels like a minute, you know, in your head. So it does feel awkward, but so important as we saw in that video, but I like there how he said 30 seconds, 40 seconds, sometimes a minute. All kids process things differently and uh, we know that students with complex communication needs often have um, a need for longer wait time, so they have a longer time to process what's, what was asked or said. So increasing that wait time to 30 seconds, 40 seconds, it's going to do all of that helpful things to help that student learn and make connections. Just by waiting, if we can just get over the awkwardness. <laughs> sure. It's hard, but it's so worth it's it. It's hard. 
<laughs> um, more reasons why it's important is I think they touched on in that video greatly, and I love the visuals they used as well. No, it was so but, good. Right? <laughs> the processing time. Again, students are going to process at different rates. We have to give them processing time because as it said in that video, otherwise we're we're breaking um short circuiting them and breaking up that process to where they're not going to fully learn and benefit from the question and having to think through it and then think of their answer. So we have to give them processing time. We have to give them time to like adjust their vision and actually be able to see it. So um, I know from personal experience, <laughs> I have glaucoma and I have poor vision um, because of the damage that it did early on. And I experienced this actually recently during one of my recent visits is that whenever I was trying to see and read the board, some the person that was working with me, the tech, was going too quick asking me to read the lines. And I, I need time to be able to move and have my vision focus in and so that I can read the letter. I'm able to, but you just have to give me more time than what you would somebody else. And um, it's the same for our kids who have visual different um, visual differences, we have to give them time to be able to focus in and see exactly what we are wanting them to see and focus on. Um, motor planning as well. Motor planning is so big for lots of our kids because lots of kids that we're working with like sometimes have lots of different forms of that apraxia. Um, and so we have to give them that time to think of what they want to say and motor plan and be able to say it or be able to move the different parts of their bodies to be able to communicate um, their response to us as well. Um, and again, just all of the above, processing vision motor planning, they have to have this time to be able to go through each of those different areas um, to really benefit from the whole process. Um, so as you wait, observe behaviors. Any change in behavior indicates processing um, and that that brain is thinking and we need to give it more think time and just to stick with it. All right, another video and this one's awesome. So we want you to be like looking at the amount of wait time the teacher gives. Um, so if you wanna like count it out in your head or count on your fingers, but pay attention to the amount of wait time that she does. And then um, a couple other points that we'll touch on when it's, when it's over. So good. So good. Very good. Where are we going to put this at, Dustin? I'm going to ask Dustin. Dustin, what letter are we going to put this under? Yeah. Yeah. And tell me it's on this card. Hmm. And I see you looking over here, and that would tell me you want the letter E, Dustin. When you read, that's the last letter of the word. We want the first letter, which is the B. So I would look here, like you did, and then you, and then I would look up here. And then at you. Yeah, and that tells me it's the letter B. I want Arnie to put this up. So lots of wait time, right? Um, an expectant wait time. She was just standing there looking at the student, you know, didn't have a sidebar conversation, didn't put other, you know, noise in the environment, just waited quietly watching the student. I mean, I counted, it was like 10 seconds and he did something and then he did it, he did something with his eyes and she verbally referenced it. She was like, I see you looking at this color that lets me know, okay. And then she waited again. Um, so great wait time, great um, verbal referencing. So connecting um, his non-symbolic communication with a symbolic way to help teach that. And then to like, 
I just feel like presumed potential, you can just feel it in this classroom. I mean, they've got this awesome way for the student to access the alphabet and they are, you know, obviously doing a motivating activity and because all the students are quiet. So like, you know, that this is a routine that they're doing um, and they are connecting his, um, the way he's looking with what that could mean for him to do spelling and writing. So I just love this video. It's just like everything wrapped up into one. <laughs> and well, and also how well she knew the system, because we talk about that too, that in order yes. to provide that aided language input, not only explicitly, but naturally to our students and really become that whole master pal. And we'll talk about that in modules to come, but she knew that system. She wasn't on the same side, but she knew, okay, we're going to look here first. And then he had to look at this color to be able to tell me the correct letter. Um, and that it, since he had looked at a different color, it wasn't that one, but I just, I was like, so good. She's so good. All right, wait time is think time may require quiet waiting. And so Maggie just kind of <laughs> introduced those perfect lead in uh, there, but uh, it's quiet waiting because that sensory that we could have going on, any kind of visual or auditory interruptions is going to essentially restart the whole process. Um, so just thinking of this and you know they have the quiet classroom and that's not something that she has a magic wand for it's not something that probably happened on the first day not even the first week maybe not even the first month that's been time of them developing that routine and again having probably a motivating activity for the kids that they were all wanting to be engaged in um and so that provided that quiet atmosphere for him to be able to really process and think and provide that answer. Um, but if we do, again, if there's any kind of distraction, you just being cognizant of that, that if there's any kind of auditory um, distraction, or like Maggie said, if you're going to have a conversation while you're giving them wait time, that's restarting that process for them because they're going to be distracted by that and want to pay attention to what you're saying. Um, any kind of visual uh, interference as well, can, especially for um, students ha who have visual differences, that's going to restart that wait time, think time. So just being cognizant of that and trying to prevent it in any uh, opportunity that we can. All right, and so let's recap our wait to our uh, time module here. So again, AAC, that umbrella terms, it means, the term, it means many things. All language is learned through demonstration of it being used in meaningful context. Um, that goes for our developmental language, our native language, foreign languages, AAC. Typical language development is our guide for teaching AAC. It has a logical and a predictable progression that we see when we are learning language and the same holds true when we are um, learning AAC, which I feel like kind of helps take off some of like some pressure there, you know, where we expect it to take some time. And we know that by what we do, we're going to help shape those behaviors to, to become language growth for students. Um, Language development is messy, so is learning and teaching AAC. Um, I just did a, a webinar for Closing the Gap, and they were talking about how being upfront, like when we're introducing AAC and saying, this is messy, <laughs> this is going to take time, we're yeah. going to fail, we are going to, um, there's going to be days where we're like, I don't like this thing, um, <laughs> like that's all to be expected. And going into it, knowing that, then takes that pressure off. Like we're not expecting this to come in and be perfect and it to work right away and um, it to be this, you know, magically we start using this thing that we know going into it, it's going to be messy. Um, it's going to take time and, you know, we have to just stick with it and reassess as we go. Same is true for learning. So I just think that's an important point to keep in mind when we're doing any of this. Think time, so AKA wait time, improves the quality of instruction for us, uh, both receptively and expressively. So great, great points that these modules had, you know. I know, and I like how you really focused in on this time. We often say it's a marathon, not a sprint with the AC, yeah. and the, the time piece comes into that so perfectly. All right, so, um, we try to condense like what we recommend to you guys um, specific to the module. So Project Core, again, they've got those 12 modules that are great for 
anybody, parents, um, paraprofessionals, teachers, related service, it doesn't matter who you are, they have developed these modules in such a way that it's great for anybody to just go and watch their short little snippets. Um, but they've got some great ones for our topics today with the presuming potential and the wait time as well. Um, practical AC, one of our little memes that came with how the progression with the presuming the potential came from there. There's always nice blogs on there that can give you some more um, information, again, from professionals who are doing it on a day-to-day -day basis. And then the System Wear um, blog has some great blogs as well. Um, one of them is from Erin Sheldon, who Maggie and I absolutely love, um, about presuming Maggie's competence. Um, the only prerequisite is um, to AEC. Um, and then everyone can learn. So those are some good ones. They're usually short reads, like six minute. They tell you at the top of the blog how long it will take you to read. So they're usually pretty short as well. And then just thanks guys for joining us for this module. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it and we look forward to discussing with you in our follow-up discussion. Yep, yep, see you soon, thanks.